In Bushmills, the morning of day 10 of our Irish road trip, we left the kiln wing of the corn mill for a leisurely breakfast at Mike's. Then we took a short stroll around the diamond and the war memorial to read the sentiments on the flowers laid in memory of Queen Elizabeth at the parade the night before. The Queen's death on the day we departed for our trip and her funeral on the day we flew back home seemed to bookend our trip. A phone call from our host at the Kiln Wing jolted us into action as we didn't realize the checkout time was 10 a.m., not 11 as we'd thought. Oops, my bad. We're all packed but still stressed at trying to get out in a hurry so that the uh, housekeeper could, could come in and clean. I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. No time to say hello, goodbye, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. We departed Bushmills and headed up the coast, taking the Antrim Coast Road east across the top of the island. Passing through Cushendal, we saw a red sandstone tower known as Curfew Tower, or Turnley's Tower. Built in 1809 by Francis Turnley of the East India Company, it was made to contain idlers and rioters. The tower was staffed by one man, day and night, armed with a musket, a bayonet, a case of pistols, and a pike that was 13 feet long. It was always provisioned for one year. It features a curfew bell which was rung religiously. Uh, the building was restored in 1992. It now serves as a location for an artist residency managed by a trust. As we continued east on the coast road, we passed the ruins of Red Bay Castle to the right up the rock face between Cushendal and Waterfoot. Built in 1561 by the Macdonald chieftain Sir James, it was later dismantled by his nephew, James of Dunluce, and the stone used to repair Dunluce Castle on the coast between Portrush and Port Ballantrae. On the road below the castle lies the picturesque Red Arch Tunnel. We followed the coastal route south to Glenariff, where we veered inland on the A43. At this point, we began following a paper map instead of sat-nav. At Ballymena, we turned south to Antrim, and the roads got progressively smaller. Trying to avoid traffic, we got hopelessly lost near Belfast Airport on small country roads, and it took us a good while, but we finally found ourselves in Crumlin. Since we had a rental car to return on time, our focus at this point shifted from sightseeing to getting to the Dublin airport. But back on the M1 near Drogheda, we crossed the Mary McAleese Bridge across the River Boyne. One of the longest cable-stayed bridges in Ireland, it was named for Mary McAleese, the President of Ireland from 1997 to 2011. Finally, back in Dublin, we returned our car to the rental agency. At the rental agency, we discovered a scrape on our car that we didn't know was there. For details on that, be sure and see our video on driving in Ireland. We were driven to the airport by a shuttle from the rental car agency, but there was lots of construction near the bus pickup for the hotels and a lot of confusion we dragged our luggage through the outside area of the airport to the bus depot and waited and waited and finally saw the bus for our hotel. We finally arrived at the Dublin Carlton, which was beautiful, but we found there was a crowd trying to check in, so we went for drinks in the bar. We started up conversations at the bar with a law officer from Montana and also a couple that were from the Central Plains of Canada. We finally got checked into our room and got a message about completing security pre-check for our flight online. Chris had other plans. I was dealing with that. I decided it was best for me to return to the bar. After taking care of the details, I joined Chris downstairs for a lovely dinner at Kitty Hawk Restaurant and Bar. Yum! Dessert! After a good night's sleep, we woke the next morning to find that on television was the Queen's funeral. Downstairs, the Carlton had an amazing buffet breakfast. 
Then we got a text message stating we needed to be at the boarding gate one and a half hours earlier than we thought. Yikes! How could I have screwed this up so bad? It was a stressed wait for the shuttle bus and the five minute drive to the airport. The shuttle bus finally arrived, but we did meet some people that lightened our moods a little bit. Back up, in a couple of earlier videos, we mentioned that Garth Brooks had taken over Croke Park Stadium with five sold out shows. Cowboy hats were everywhere covering Dublin. On the shuttle, we talked to a couple behind us on the bus that had flown in from Denmark to see Garth Brooks. Their English was limited, but much better than our Danish. We tried to explain where we were from. You know, small town, slower pace of life, etc. I finally said, some people would say redneck. They smiled and in unison said, We, we love, love rednecks! rednecks. The shuttle driver dropped the uh, Danish couple off at their airline and proceeded to tell us he had seen two of the five Garth Brooks shows so far. And he would have gone to a third if he could just have gotten one more ticket. When we arrived at our terminal, we went into the Aer Lingus counter. We weren't sure where to go or what to do. I asked one of the Aer Lingus employees if he could help us. He was a wonderful supervisor who was training new employees. He told us not to worry, we had plenty of time, and he used us as a demo to the trainees on how to get passengers quickly and efficiently through the process. Go Aer Lingus! The issue was the timing of U.S. preclearance for customs, of which we were unaware. There's a great video on this, we'll link to it. The time texted to us was not our actual boarding or departure time, but the time we needed to be through the Irish Customs and present for U.S. pre-clearance. Phew! We actually got through Irish Security and Customs and arrived 45 minutes early for U.S. pre-clearance. Which was a good thing, since in our hurried departure from the Kilnwing, we inadvertently left behind some sweets and whiskey we had purchased at the co-op and an off-license store in Bushmills. We hope the housekeeper at the Kiln Wing enjoyed those goodies. But the extra time gave us a chance to shop the large duty-free area for replacement souvenirs for our family and friends back home. We filled out our VAT forms for a tax refund on the gifts we had purchased in Ireland and turned them in, as well as time to have one last Guinness on Irish soil. Next, we were on to U.S. pre-clearance. It was a snap since we had global entry passes worth the money. And on to our gate. We boarded our flight and we were off to return home. In the coming weeks, we'll unpack what we learned on our trip to Ireland and share it with you. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything and we'll see you next week.